uh, our speaker, Patrick James from the University of Montreal. Um, Patrick did his PhD with Marie Jose Fortin at the University of Toronto and worked on birth names. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> talk about it. And then, uh, so doing some landscape genetics and then moved on uh, for a postdoc with Felix Perling and uh, Coltman, David Coltman, working on the mountain pine beetle. Uh, again, some spatial landscape stuff. Um, got hired in 2011 at the University of Montreal, where he's now an assistant professor and working more on spatial things. Uh, disturbance, especially uh, focusing on forest uh, system. I think this is what he's going to talk about today. Okay, Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, it's genuinely my pleasure to get to share with you guys some of the work that uh, I've been doing. I've been doing in the lab just on, on the other side of the hill here. I think I've got a Mac room, water, my phone, and my talk, so I think I have everything that I need. Um, my title is, is grand, perhaps. Um, uh, I intend to talk about spatial heterogeneity, the forest structure, uh, diversity, in terms of forest diversity, and uh, the importance of considering dispersal in insect outbreak systems. Uh, so in general, first and foremost, I'm interested in forests. Um, I find them very interesting. They're complex, multi-trophic systems. They're governed by multiple processes at multiple spatial and temporal scales, and they interact and they produce these emergent patterns of, of forest composition and age with lots and lots of ecological processes involved. So these are interesting, complex, dynamic systems and I find them, them fascinating. The particular element that I've become interested in is understanding uh, forest disturbance dynamics. And a disturbance would be anything that takes a patch of forest and resets it to a young age or a different composition. So we're talking about forest management, cutting, we're talking about fires, insect outbreaks, there's this wind throw disease, but I'm going to restrict myself in the talk today. I'm going to talk to you about insect outbreaks, which I find also very interesting because of the, the complex elements that exist in, in population dynamics of insects. This is an example of some, some trees that have been killed by the spruce budworm in northern Quebec. Uh, these are fir trees. You can see they're varying colors of gray and red. Um, and this is the result of several years of persistent defoliation by the larval form of this, this critter. And you can see it's surrounded by a mix of, of deciduous trees. And one of the ideas I'm going to be talking about is this role of forest diversity on attenuating the impacts of these outbreaks. So you can imagine situations where the forest would be completely homogeneous we, we hypothesize that the outbreaks are going to be, in fact, more severe. Um, unfortunately, here it seems that these guys hadn't read about this theory. And so even despite being surrounded by deciduous trees, have been affected pretty severely. They're, they're all dead now, no doubt. Um, just a, a brief series of platitudes about insect outbreaks in, in Canada. Uh, so as I was mentioning, insect outbreaks are a significant agent of, agent of disturbance. They affect millions of hectares of forest animals. Uh, their dynamics are shaped by multiple factors. And what's important is that they both influence and are influenced by landscape spatial structure. So there's this reciprocal feedback between the landscapes and these ecological processes. And an important element is, is dispersal and movement. And I'm going to talk about drilling into that idea of dispersal and how to get a better handle on it. The graph here is usually what I put up to, to troll other disturbance ecologists and show that insects are so much more important because of the area affected. And, and of course, this refers to the area affected, not necessarily killed, whereas fires and logging are removing the wood. So it's possible to have an insect outbreak that doesn't actually remove the force. It doesn't re reset it. So it sort of acts like this smear on the landscape rather than a cut of you know, reducing growth rates or changing uh, successional dynamics. Nonetheless, in terms of area affected, Insects remain the most significant disturbance in, in the boreal forest. So when I talk about insect disturbances, there are a couple of stories that are, I would argue, the most important and significant right now. The first is that of the mountain pine beetle. So this is a, a beetle pest in Western Canada. Since the early 2000s, it's been in outbreak mode and has produced these phenomenal patterns of forest destruction that have reached over 16 million hectares. What we can see here in the yellow are areas that were killed between 2002 and 2006, and that's sort of within the historical range. It's not unusual to have a large outbreak of Mount Pine Beetle. What we have up top, though, uh, these axes A and B, is the continued northward and eastward spread that are effectively without precedent in, in our known history. So these outbreaks are behaving differently. Uh, we've got over 16 million hectares of forest that have been, been affected. 
And it is also important to point out that these areas in red and, and orange have not become parking lots. There is succession that happens after that. There's still forests, but they're functioning very differently. And the timber industry has lost a significant amount of revenue from this, this, this problem. Um, as I was saying, it's further east than ever before, but also it's further north. Just last year, it breached 60 degrees. So the first time ever, the Northwest Territories, that government has to consider the influence of mountain pine beetle on their timber resources, in addition to their other, their other problems. So more close to home, uh, another insect species is the spruce budworm. Uh, this is a native Lepidopteran forest pest. It, it's caterpillars, I sort of mentioned that a moment ago, they enjoy eating spruce and fir trees and they're very good at it. Uh, we have an outbreak in progress, one that's been long expected and has really started to pick up steam. We've got about 3 million hectares currently affected in Quebec. You can see the areas that, are, that have been, been affected recently. Most important in this northern region around Baie-Comeau, the Côte Nord region of Quebec. Um, and that's also interesting, that's sort of without precedent. Usually, historically, we have information about these outbreaks starting in the Ottawa Valley and then moving east and west. This is the first time that we've seen an outbreak starting up north. And so, of course, the vagaries and uncertainty of these systems is, we can ask questions, is this the influence of, of climatic change or legacies of forest management, or is this just stochastic variability? In any case, it's very interesting, and we have a great deal of of concern about the continued southward migration of this outbreak into New Brunswick, which is, has a lot of uh, its industry dependent on plantation forestry. So they've been hit very hard in the past. So there's a lot of interest in understanding the patterns of dispersal and the risk factors associated with this outbreak as it moves, moves south. These outbreaks I find fascinating because they're capable of these really dramatic events. This is a photo taken um, near Rimouski last summer, uh, first week of July, I think, where there's this inflight of moths. Those are all tiny spruce budworm moths, and they're all about that big. And there were hundreds of thousands. They covered cars as their bodies fell from the lamps. So is this a local population, or is this an immigrant population? If it's an immigrant population, where did it come from? Can we derive a model to predict the probability of this sort of inflight, arguably to lay eggs and start another infestation? What is the distance that they can do this? So uh, really phenomenal population explosions over several orders of magnitude. So I, I don't want to go too much in, into life history because I've got lots of other ideas around the system I want to discuss, but just to be sure that you're familiar with the beast in question, uh, th this is the spruce butter, and there he is on the right. Um, everywhere in black here has been affected at least once between 1945 and 1988. So we're not talking about a small scale forest process, we're talking about a continental scale ecosystem process uh, that has periodic outbreaks every 35 to 40 years. So it disappears, it comes back, it disappears. They've got paleoecological evidence that these outbreaks go back thousands of years. Uh, a fellow named Hubert Lorrain at Chicoutimi has used logs taken from bogs and, and They've been preserved in the bottoms of these bogs and done dendrochronological, dendrochronological reconstruction of the tree rings to identify that there have been outbreaks going back 4,000 years. So this has been with us since the glaciers receded. Nonetheless, it keeps happening. So the fern spruce, 35 years, um, and we compete with them effectively for our timber resources. If we didn't want to cut down spruce and fir trees, it would be an academic curiosity, but it certainly wouldn't have the applied management problems. We want the same things they want. So we want to understand how to better manage our systems to minimize their influence. It's improbable that we would ever eradicate it, but our objective is to understand how we can perhaps reduce the effect and you know, recoup some of these potential losses. These insect outbreaks are spatial phenomena in which dispersal, as in their movement, and spatial context, that being the conditions of the forest around them, nearby, play key roles. Now, I want to make a little distinction here, and I want to talk about effective dispersal. I'm not just talking about movement, but effective dispersal involves the organism's capacity, the spatial context, and then its survival at a location. It's fine to go somewhere, but if you don't reproduce there, who cares? So that's the difference between dispersal and effective dispersal. So I'm going to continue from now on talking about dispersal in this context of an effective dispersal. So we have several known unknowns. Talking about unknown unknowns is a different talk. But we have known unknowns. First of all, is how important is dispersal in insect outbreaks of the beetle or the, the bugworm? Uh, remarkably, we don't really understand the role of dispersal. 
There's been interesting work using radar and airplanes and nets in the 80s that could show that these moths have the capacity to disperse up to 400 kilometers and then dump themselves in the ocean, which is not effective dispersal. But they're capable of really long distance dispersal, but we don't know what the relative frequency of those types of distances are. And really we want to create a model of dispersal that takes into account the probability of moving locally or long distances. We also know that we don't know exactly how landscape structure and connectivity affect dispersal as well as the predation dynamics. So if we're thinking about the insect outbreak system, we're talking about both bottom-up effects, including the availability of the forest, as well as the predation, so the birds and the insects that prey on them. So we don't know about dispersal. We don't know the role of landscape connectivity. So ultimately, the objective of, of my lab currently is to explore these questions around insect outbreak systems, especially the spruce bugworm system, uh, to understand how an improved understanding of dispersal and trophic interactions can improve our ability to evaluate risk. Okay, now risk is in red because risk is a particular term and it's loaded, so I'm going to define it. Um, I spend a lot of time talking about risk, but when I talk about risk, I'm talking about two elements when we consider forests and their susceptibility to, to insect attack. The first is uh, local stand susceptibility. So here's a heterogeneous forest. We've got some fir, some spruce, a deciduous trees. So this would involve things like composition, age, site type, vigor, neighborhood. So I'll talk more about that later, but you can imagine an element of fragmentation or spatial context, composition around the forest. But there's also this important idea of risk that includes the proximity to attack stands. So places where the outbreak is already. How far away are we from that potential source? So we have this element of dispersal as we move from one place to the other. And we don't know about these distances that well. Like, what is the probability of going a certain distance? These moths turned out a bit cuter than I expected. <laughs> it's actually a beta that I turned around and stuck two of them together. Because <laughs> it was easier to do it in text, right? There's a trick for it. Okay, so I want to talk about these distances. And why do we care about uh, the distances between locations and where they end up? Well, because if we want to model spatial dynamics, we need to know about these things called dispersal kernels, or that's at least, at least the way I'm formulating the problem. So a dispersal kernel is just a, 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 a function that describes the probability of moving a certain distance. Okay, so we've got the distances on the x-axis, and we have the probability of moving there on the y. And these curves are shaped by these different parameters. So here's the beta, and here are the three levels. So we can get these different shapes of the curves dependent on these parameters. So looking at patterns of dispersal, empirical observed patterns of dispersal, ideally we'd start to extract some parameters and begin to characterize these curves. This is unfortunately non-trivial because there's not just one, pardon me, there's not just one form of the model. There's all sorts of different forms and curves we can take. So we have this additional challenge of identifying what are the parameters, but first what are the shapes? What is the model form of this dispersal? And this remains uncertain with regards to the, the spruce bugworm, despite its, its renown. So what I've been doing is trying to evaluate spruce budworm dispersals. That's a roundabout way to getting to this point. I'm interested in budworm dispersal. We've been taking a three-step process to doing this. And the first, most of it involves using population genetics. And I'll talk in more detail about that in a bit. But right now, just the notion that we can describe landscape structure, we can describe genetic structure of the population. And from that, we can infer probability of dispersal. So we're characterizing larval population structure. We're then trapping moths in the woods uh, based on predicted phenology. So they're very powerful phenological models, which simply means the development with respect to, to weather or climate. So we can predict when we should catch moths. We go out, we catch moths, and we assess whether they should be there or not. If they shouldn't be there, they came from somewhere else. Where did they come from? Uh, and then finally, in this, this process, we can distinguish residents from migrants using genetic markers as well. So this is a three-step process to characterizing dispersal in the bottom system. Our sampling strategy has been uh, Quebec-wide. So these areas in green in this figure are areas that are currently experiencing an outbreak. The points in red are where we've gone and collected larvae and moths. This has involved a lot of driving. So we visit each of these sites and we collect larvae, we clip branches, we shake larvae off and we have the little larvae and these represent a, a, a resident population. We also install pheromone traps at each location and we collect moths. These pheromones, they're male attracted pheromones, it's a female pheromone, they come in, 
very unfortunate, there's insecticide, they die, we take them back and grind them up. Um, so we can we collect these moths three times over the season, and we can characterize the resident populations, resident using the larvae, and we characterize migrants using the moths. Okay, so this large network of sites. And really, the question, the fundamental question is, we see all these different patches of outbreak. Are these actually independent outbreaks, or are they synchronized large outbreak that is just in different places? Um, is dispersal synchronizing these outbreaks, or is just correlated weather patterns? Is the weather correlating these outbreaks? And that's a, a, a it's a simple question to say, but it's fundamental, and it's it's not sure whether these these outbreaks are being synchronized by weather or by dispersal. Understanding one or the other can have, uh, if it is one or the other, can have severe management implications for the system. So what we've been doing for the last two years, I'll show you 2013, is we go out to all of these sites first and we, we collect L4 larvae and we rear them individually on synthetic diet. So up here on the left, these are all little cups that we put a little caterpillar in with a little synthetic diet that we order from Sault Ste. Marie. And they enjoy it, they love it, they eat, and then they, turn, they, they close and they turn into moths. To the right was an effort to try to do it more efficiently by putting branches in a bucket. It did not work. Um, too hot, they'll die. So we're sticking with the, the single cup measure, so it's a bit labor intensive to have students in there checking the, the little cups every day. If you're interested in volunteering in the summer, <laughs> happy to have you. Uh, in the end, we reared over 2,300 moths, um, and we'll take 30 of those per site to be sequenced. We'll, we'll develop genetic, developing genetic markers, we'll sequence these individuals, and we'll start to try to understand the, the relative population structure. For those who might be interested in the predators, we also reared out over 450 parasitoids. And the parasitoids are these little tiny species of wasp that actually lay their eggs inside the bodies of the caterpillars. Those eggs hatch into tiny larvae, they eat the larvae from the inside out, they emerge, spin their own cocoon, and, and then hatch as, as wasps. So these are one of the main predators in this system. So when you collect a larvae, you try to rear it to an adult, sometimes these other guys come out. We noticed this, we started collecting them, we got an interesting diversity of parasitoids from the system. So anyway, the, the larvae that we collect here, we classify as residents. Because we, we caught them as babies, we know they're from there, that's the local population. The next step was to go out and empty our moth traps, which we did three times. So we collected moths before they should be there, according to our phenological model, we collected moths when they should be there, so at the peak of the predicted phenology, and then much after that predicted phenology. So anything we caught before and after should be migrants. They should be moths that come from somewhere else. And we're interested in finding out where they came from. So we can use our genetic markers to try to cluster them with the resident sites and see how they fit together. And then we'll take 30 of these moths. We had some traps that got filled with over 6,000 moths uh, during the peak period. Like, they filled it. We couldn't get any more. So the, the populations up there are enormous. So just to elaborate a little bit on this idea of, of the, the timing, the phenology, the black curve is the cumulative probability of moth eclosion as a function of, of local climate weather conditions, meaning the probability that that big caterpillar is going to turn into a moth. And so we want it to be there far before that happens, so the green line. So we go and meet empty traps way before we should have seen any moths. We visited them again right at the peak, and this is where we were finding these traps with 5,000 individuals. Um, and then we emptied those, and we came again much later in September, and uh, we collected them again. We assume anything that arrives in September probably emigrated from the north, and those that we catch in July probably emigrated from the south. So we have, there's a lot of movement going on in the system, or we hypothesized there was. And fortunately, we did, we found just that. So this is the result of our trap capture in 2013. Uh, in July. So everything that is a yellow circle that's solid shows places where we found, uh, found moths when they shouldn't have been there. This was contrary to the, the uh, phenological predictions. Uh, we found lots of moths. Same thing in September. There's a lot of movement. They're moving around a lot. And the thing with moth dispersal with insects is it's not so much, it's not precisely a, a, an active process. They're not flapping their little wings and trying to go several hundred kilometers. They actually detect changes in atmospheric pressure and fly up when a storm's coming in. And they basically get sucked up with these storms and they disperse passively, potentially very long distances with these storm clouds. So in a way, you could consider that dispersal here is perhaps 
less of a biological process and perhaps more of a meteorological process. Modeling it in terms of weather systems might be more appropriate. In any case, they're moving around a lot. We we're able to detect this. We have interesting samples representing our local populations as well as our, our migrant populations. So I debated how much I wanted to talk about the role of how we're going to use population genetics here. Well, I'm going to give a bit of an overview. Um, the idea is that when you collect individuals, you can estimate their genotypes. You have genotypes referenced at locations, you can then estimate the probability of gene flow between two locations using these genotypes. Okay, so with gene flow, you can estimate dispersal. Um, basically, this is based on the idea of genetic variability or genetic distance. Something called FST is very popular. It's basically the ratio between the, the variance in the whole study area and that found in individual sites. FST is kind of analogous to an ANOVA in a way if you had two factors, like the whole area and within a, a subgroup. With things like genetic distance, we expect a decline in genetic similarity with increasing distance, but that decline is the, the, the dispersal response. So at what point the similarity ceases to be interesting or significant uh, between two locations, or between pairs of locations, could indicate the dispersal capacity of the organism. And then further to differentiate, differentiate our residents from migrants, we can ask these questions, do the trap moths uh, cluster well with the resident larvae? Do they cluster with them at the same or different locations? So this is all about this effort to distinguish residents from migrants, and then to parameterize those dispersal kernels. The spruce butterworm is one of the most well-studied organisms, I'd say, ever. I'll be brave and I will say that. Uh, people have been studying it for a very long time because of all these exciting things that's done in Eastern Canada. Despite that, we have very little information about its genomic architecture, its population genetics. Uh, it turns out, uh, and I'll defer to collaborators if there are other questions, that their, their DNA is actually very difficult to work with and it's very messy. There are lots of other non-meaningful repeating segments in the DNA which is sort of held back the development of molecular markers for use in population genetics. There is new technology now um, called genotyping by sequencing, which is a next generation sequencing technique which is being used to develop SNP markers to examine spatial genetic variability in, in the bottom system. Um, for us, the data processing steps, we're, we do DNA extraction in our lab in, in UDM. We send those DNA to the IBIS facility at Université de Lab. Uh, for library preparation and PCR, and then it gets sent back here to the McGill Genome Center for, for sequencing. Uh, it was suggested to me earlier today that I should perhaps consider the carbon footprint of this research project <laughs> as things are being shipped back and forth between cities. Uh, there are several research groups working on this, this problem, including a group at the CFS in Quebec City, uh, Michel Cousson and uh, Lisa Lumley. There's also Felix Sperling at the University of Alberta. Uh, in collaboration so far, about a thousand usable SNPs have been identified with a read depth of about 20x uh, uh, per individual. So we've got, we're getting some good markers and we're just starting on the analysis phase of these DNA, of these markers. And just for those who may not know what I mean when I say a, a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism, you can imagine multiple individuals that have a sequence of A's, T's, C's and G's. The polymorphism is the location for which there are variable values. And it's this variation that we're interested in studying to differentiate populations. So like I said, we're just starting on this study with Quebec. We're developing the new markers. So it's a bit of a top-heavy enterprise. Uh, in the meantime, we've been working on another project using the budworm as well, but in a different region. This is a region called the Border Lakes Landscape. So it straddles the border between Ontario and northern Minnesota. We did a project there a few years ago where we collected budworm across a non-outbreaking region. So it was something like 10 man hours, search hours per site to find maybe a dozen larvae because they were just at this endemic low density. We found these larvae, they were sequenced, and we were using microsatellite markers, which I described aren't the most effective, but we had some. And uh, we wanted to, to compare larval and adult genetic structure in this region. So I'm not a population geneticist, I'm someone who studied using lots of multivariate statistics, so this seems to me always to be a multivariate, um, multivariate question. Anyone ever use Kanoko, the, the multivariate? And there was the splash screen at the beginning, it said, um, what is it, if, if, if you see, if you have a good hammer, you see every problem as a nail, that was the splash screen. And so 
Multivariate analysis is a great hammer, and so you do tend to start to see things as nails. And even a, a, a genetic data table would seem like a good nail that was appropriate to hit with multivariate analysis. It turns out I'm not alone in this idea. It's a useful approach. But we analyzed uh, allele frequencies among these sites. And so in blue are the larval sites. So HL would be site H, larval individuals. Uh, AA would be adults at site A. So the blue are the larvae, the red are the adults. And what's cool about this is we see a certain level of spread in the larvae. We do not see as much spread in the adults. And so what we see is that the adults probably have one or two sources, whereas the larvae represent the actual resident population. So I only show this to you, the statistical power of this analysis is not fantastic, but that it's possible to distinguish these residents from migrants and potentially identify the source of emigrating moths by using this sort of a, a genetic approach. So it looks like site B, which is in the southwest there, was the source of many of them. And in fact, that corresponds very well with observations that there was active defoliation in that area. So a bit of a mini outbreak was happening. Uh, not enough to synchronize with the rest of the system, but a small outbreak there. So it seems pretty likely that that's where they came from. So this is what we hope to repeat or replicate in Quebec using our, our newfangled markers. So our ongoing work with regards to uh, the, the bloodborne population genetics in Quebec, we're currently sequencing samples from 2012 and 2013, characterizing this spatial structure. We're going to commence the process of fitting these dispersal kernels to the genetic data. Um, and there are many ways to do that. Uh, we're extending our sampling network for 2014 into the Côte Sud with the greater concern about the New Brunswick forests. We're going to set some sites up in the Gaspé Z and track dispersal and movement southward as well. And then eventually, once we get this all sorted out, we'll be moving on to examining the role of landscape structure on dispersal and using this sort of approach of, of landscape genetics. Um, because it's interesting, you can see that these outbreak patches, so red is defoliated from 2013. It's not random on the landscape. It's clear that they're following some sort of landscape feature. And perhaps our models of, of dispersal and movement should take into account how the landscape structure might be funneling or influencing these patterns of dispersal. Okay. So that's the story about dispersal and the spruce bottom. And I mentioned earlier that I was going to talk about uh, the role of landscape structure and connectivity. Uh, and as some new study uh, in landscape ecology and forestry, I'm very interested in these bottom-up influences. Uh, so a traditional trophic model of an insect outbreak system involves these three levels. We've got the spruce bloodworm, we've got the parasitoids or birds or something that preys on it from above, as well as the availability of, of tree hosts, okay, so the density. But we know that, that tree hosts, it's not, it shouldn't really be considered as an aspatial abstract entity. Uh, it's in fact a very complex thing. People spend all of their time understanding force dynamics and structure, and it's important to consider the spatial and temporal variability. It's also important because it's one of the few things that we actually have control over as humans. In our system, we cut forests and we make new patterns. We don't have as much control over climate, or we don't have as much direct control over other population processes. We have control over landscape structure. We'll laugh for the lumberjack, okay? <laughs> In this system, it's also it's, it's made further interesting by the, the spruce bloodworm isn't the only species out there. There's actually this whole suite of competing moth species, other types of Tertrisids, other moths that are in the system, that sort of act as a, a reservoir for some of these predators. And this is sort of thought to be one of the ways that, that, that uh, the parasitoids can persist in this population, even in the absence of a bloodworm outbreak, because there's this community of other competing moth species. But this link has seldom been put together. And it seems that if you have a more diverse forest, you get more competitors, which actually increases the parasitoid population, which can have a feedback and influence the spruce bloodworm. So this theory is that, the simple diagram, is that diverse forests might be better at controlling bloodworm outbreaks, or at least attenuating their effects. So does forest diversity relate to parasitoid diversity? There's been talk about this, and it's been speculated, but it's not yet been tested. So this, this sort of an idea that forest structure can affect outbreak dynamics or other ecological processes has a long history in forestry. 
Uh, it was labeled a thing called the subcultural hypothesis, and there was this cool article in 93 by two anthropologists, not ecologists, who sort of took uh, the forest management community in Canada as their ethnography, as you will. Like, they studied what the foresters were saying and how there was all this debate and uncertainty about whether the forest matters in outbreak dynamics or not. Because, of course, you can imagine these classic debates, one group saying, oh, it's only bottom up, the other saying, oh, it's only top down, and someone in the middle saying, well, it's both. So they summarized this and how this perspective had evolved through time. It's got this long history. I'm certainly not the first one to ask the questions about it. The basic premise is simply that forest structure can influence defoliation. This is largely motivated by this one article by Blay in 1983, who over the three recent outbreaks in, um, in the 20th century, we saw an increase in the area affected, a pretty steady linear increase in the area affected. And he suggested that this was due to human changes to the landscape, that we'd homogenized the forest, we'd selected for balsam fir, the more preferred host, and somehow we changed landscape structure and made it more susceptible. So we're to blame for this increase in uh, uh, outbreak extent. Not everyone agrees with that. A fellow named Tom Royama wrote a paper in 2005 that demonstrated all this is, he did all these simulations using stochastic population processes. And he found one series that replicated exactly the pattern that Blay had found empirically. And then his argument was, well, we can get the same pattern just through stochastic processes. There's nothing related to actual influence of forest. It's just stochasticity. So we could get it, we, we can get it anyway just with weather. So it couldn't be the role so this no model approach. It couldn't be the role of the forest, it's just weather variability, because I found one run of three peaks in my simulation. So there's, there's a lot of debate about this. And I still think it's worth questioning with actual data. So this premise that forest structure influences defoliation, it's based on a lot of observations recently that diverse stands tend to show less defoliation. So stands that have more hardwood content are affected less. Um, and that this effect appears greater than a simple reduction of host. You can say, well, if you have half as much host and you get half as much defoliation, well, that makes sense because you've got half as much host. But in fact, the reduction in mixed stands is above and beyond that simple reduction in host. There seems to be an active element of forest diversity on reducing the, uh, the severity of these, these outbreaks. So the question, does diversity equal greater forest stability? Uh, can we ask this question? Can we test it? Um, of course, we need a hypothesized mechanism. And that mechanism that's been promoted is that of, that of parasitoids, so this community of mobile parasitoid wasps that, that may be reacting to forest structure and creating a sort of an indirect, it's a top down effect that's indirectly influenced by forest structure. So I just want to drive the point home that we are really good at changing landscape structure as humans. These are uh, three images from Google Earth in Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia. They're just cut block patterns. They're more or less the same scale of the image, but we're, we're really good at changing landscape pattern through human activity. And uh, I would argue firmly that it would be very naive to consider that there aren't consequences on, on ecosystem processes as a result of these changes. Especially in considering, you know, some of the, the systems are already incredibly complex. So this is from Eldon Evely in, in 97, or 2007. And he, he mapped this complete spruce budworm food web, which is phenomenal. You got balsam fir there in green in the middle, and the spruce budworm Christinura from Nifirana just above. And these, the first level up are, are parasitoids, and then there are hyperparasitoids, and then a tertiary level of hyper-hyperparasitoids. So it's like these Russian nesting dolls of terrifying wasps attacking other terrifying wasps. <laughs> but it's this, this very complex system. Now this is, this is an example of the entire system, so it's seldom operating with all of these links at the same time because there's an endemic, an early epidemic, a late epidemic subset to this food web. But this is the full, full food web. And, you know, I thank Alden very much for, for producing this, this figure because it it's important to demonstrate the complexity of this. So imagine this interaction between the landscape structure we're creating, these types of complex interactions, so there's got to be some effects in here. So it, as I said, it'd be naive to consider that there wouldn't be. I have the privilege to focus just on one of these, number 10, 
is uh, Glypto femiferana. So this is one species of wasp that you find early in outbreak. So I'm going to talk about that guy a little bit, a bit more, and uh, how it relates to forest structure. So I just have a little cartoon to illustrate some of these ideas of diversity stability. I see that my time is running, so I'm going to go through it quickly. Um, but you imagine that this little rectangle here represents a stand that has some level of diversity. Here it's low. Um, it's homogeneous host. We have the, the start of an outbreak, indicated by the red, which grows. The gray is the dead forest in the middle. But then we hypothesize that there would be this sort of defense response of the stand. There would be this mobilization of parasitoids who are present, who would begin to attack the, the larvae as their population grows. But if they aren't sufficient in number, the outbreak will grow and the stand will be destroyed by the outbreak. In contrast, the hypothesis is if we have a, a diverse stand, we have the same process begin, but this time we have a larger response of parasitoids because this diverse stand can support a greater diversity and abundance of parasitoids, and as a result, the outbreak doesn't go bananas and it doesn't destroy the stand. So that's just in isolation, sort of one single stand. Eldon in 2007 coined this, this term, the bird feeder effect, perhaps it's been indicated elsewhere before, it's the first time I read about it, describing how these parasitoids are not only responding to forest diversity, but they're also highly mobile. So this is where the forest context and neighborhood effects come into play. So in fact, they're able to move from one place to another when the bugworm population starts to grow. So like a bird feeder. So you imagine here's the start of the outbreak, but these patches don't exist in isolation, they exist in some sort of spatial context, in the neighborhood of other patches. Each of which have their own population of parasitoids, which are able to, with some degree of efficiency, switch their host and move towards that developing patch. Here, through the combined effect of this neighborhood, they're able to reduce the rate of outbreak. So we have this role of fragmentation in this, this bird feeder effect, but in fact there's a greater distance between patches. We have the same story, developing outbreak, but in this case, some of these patches are too far away. The dispersal capacity of the parasitoids isn't such that, isn't sufficient for them to get to the point of developing outbreak. So the patch succumbs to the outbreak because it's too isolated. And I won't get to talk about it as much as I'd like, but this brings us to the question of what is the parasitoid dispersal ability, and how does it relate to that of the bugworm? If we have a landscape that's fragmented at a certain scale, what, how do the, the different levels of dispersal capacity between the two species turn into observed defoliation patterns? Can the predators chase the budworm? Or are the budworm, because they're able to go far, able to outstrip the dispersal capacities of the parasitoids? We don't know. We'd have a role of diversity in this bird feeder effect. There's different levels, like the populations are different sizes in these different patches. So here we have the outbreak gets out of control because the neighboring patches were not sufficiently diverse to sustain a local population of parasitoids. And I think you can imagine what happens next. We look at the integration between fragmentation and diversity. We try to understand how the mobility and abundance and diversity of these parasitoids can be brought to bear on the control of the outbreak at a focal patch. So these are questions that have been hypothesized. They're speculated. We don't, we don't know. So what we're doing right now is we're going out into the North Shore and we're collecting parasitoids. We're collecting larvae and we're rearing them to parasitoids. There are, we are fortunate to have a lot of great spatial data for the province of Quebec. This is a US, USD land cover data. It's from about 2000. It's a bit dated. But it's 30 meter resolution raster data with which we can characterize both the fragmentation and the composition of the forest around focal sites. So we're collecting parasitoids at a location. We're collecting parasitoids at a location. We're describing the community structure there. And then we're trying to relate it to the fragmentation and the force composition around that site. So you can see, imagine these two little spots. That's the Manicolagian Dam, uh, Manic Sank, just at the top there. So you can look at what's the, what's the context, what's the force context around each of those sites. There remain these other challenges like at what scale should we describe that structure? What size should that ring be? And so this is work that some of my graduate students are working on right now. And we've been successful at collecting these parasitoids, and we're starting to describe them and look at the spatial variability in these communities. Uh, one of our challenges right now is to get um, enough samples. The parasitism rates are about 5 to 
So we need to collect a thousand larvae and rear them individually to get a hundred, optimistically, a hundred parasitoids. So we're looking at ways to increase the sample size. So I said I'd talk a bit about landscape genetics. Um, at the end, this is this idea of, if we're interested in understanding dispersal of either the moth or the parasitoid, we're interested in whether the landscape, the spatial structures, are influencing its movement or not. So landscape genetics is this, this combination of spatial statistics, landscape ecology, and population genetics to ask the question, um, how is dispersal affected by landscape structure, the, the, the composition, configuration, fragmentation? And in this context, you can imagine that we'd have three sites. So landscape genetics sort of formalizes spatial relationships into graphs where you've got nodes and you've got links. A node is a location. A link is something that describes the connection between them. We've got three nodes here, A, B, and C. We've got three links, A, C, A, B, and B, C, each of which have a length indicated by the D. Okay? In, landscape, in traditional spatial genetics, what we'd be doing is we'd be looking at uh, just relating the genetic distance and geographic distance. In landscape genetics, we assume that landscape structures, say this gray blob, which could represent a mountain or a lake or whatever, actually influence patterns of movement. And the new D3, the one in red, will do a better job at predicting the genetic differentiation among sites. So this is how we incorporate landscape structure into predictive models of genetic structure. I've been working on this idea of something called integrated landscape genetics, which goes a little bit further than landscape genetics in, in that a traditional landscape genetic perspective is interested in how abiotic features of the landscape influence dispersal and gene flow. An integrated landscape genetic approach acknowledges that biotic interactions could be involved in influencing patterns of dispersal as well. Okay, so how do biotic features, including the genetic structure of other species, how do they influence the genetic structure you observe in your focal species. So more pointedly, with regards to the budworm system, we could ask questions about how do the parasitoids, either the population abundance, diversity, or genetic structure, influence spruce budworm dispersal and its genetic structure. So it's, it's weaving together these multiple taxa to make integrated models of dispersal and gene flow. Okay, so here, same idea. Instead of a mountain, the patch in green here represents some elevated density of, uh, of predators, or a prey, or a resource. So these biotic interactions on the landscape can help describe the probability of movement between two patches. I've done a lot of work with this with the mountain pine beetle. So I want to just walk you through a quick example using the pine beetle. And it's a bit more impressive because there are three species in this system. There are beetles, pine trees, and fungi. So we have these hypothesized relationships. We've got this genetic structure or abundance of these three species and a bunch of abiotic features. In a traditional spatial genetics analysis, we'd be interested in the relationship between distance, just geographic distance, and the genetic structure of these species. To go into landscape genetics, we're interested in how this suite of environmental variables might influence the genetic structure of the taxa involved in the system. And then finally, to go into an integrated perspective, we're looking at not only the relationships between the abiotic factors, but also the interactions among species. And you'll note here that the system that I've indicated is not entirely symmetrical. There are some arrows that are absent, because we don't expect the fungi to be influencing the genetic structure of the pine trees as much, just on account of generation time, or the temporal scale at which these species exist. So with regards to the budworm system, this is the framework that we're currently applying. We have information about the environment, the, the, the landscape context. We're looking at parasitoid abundance and diversity, and we're examining spruce budworm uh, genetic structure. And our objective of integrating these things is to develop a better model of risk, to understand the probability of outbreaks and these population dynamics at broad spatial scales, to improve our ability to manage and safeguard forest resources. So with that, I'll acknowledge um, funders, NSERC, FQRIMT, CFI, and U2M, a uh, big team of collaborators, lots of students who've been watching larvae in the lab and driving around for countless hours, uh, as well as some other uh, contacts for, for discussions and, uh, and data. I'll be happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you.